All right, and welcome back to the College Hockey South podcast. My name is Henry Oho, and on this week's episode, we featured the Division One men's Division One and the women's division coaches of the year, head coach Greg Dreveny from the University of Alabama and head coach Lee Zervis from the University of Tampa. We talked to both of them about uh, the season that has been for both of them, looked ahead to nationals, got a little bit, of bit about their background in hockey and how you know, their sort of hockey journeys led to them being the, the coaches of their respective programs. So I had a lot of fun uh, talking with both of them as we uh, wrap up the regular season and head into nationals here in a couple of weeks. So with that being said, we're going to send it over to our first interview with Alabama D1 head coach, Greg Jeveny. We're going to send it over there right now. All right. And welcome back to the College Hockey South podcast. This week, we are joined by the College Hockey South Division I Coach of the Year, head coach from the University of Alabama, Coach Greg Dreveny. Greg, thanks so much for joining us this week. Thanks, Henry. Glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're going to take a look back here at the, the season so far here in a few minutes. But before we kind of dive into the season uh, that's been so far and looking back um, it, on past years and looking ahead to nationals coming up, I uh, wanted to get a, a, a little insight into your background. I, I found your hockey DB earlier, and I saw that you were from uh, Ontario, which is obviously a long way uh, from the University of Alabama, playing in the OHL, playing pro uh, in the state of Alabama. I just wanted to hear a little bit about how your uh, hockey journey kind of brought you to becoming uh, the head coach of Alabama and, of course, uh, the coach of the year this year. Well, Henry, grew up on, a, on the farm in southern Ontario, kind of right across from Detroit. And growing up in that area, you have two things. You can either farm or you can play hockey. And I told my dad when I was 15 that I was the youngest one and I was leaving and I was going to pursue a hockey career somewhere. And uh, that led me to Waterloo. I played junior B in Waterloo when I was 15. Um, the following year, when uh, I was actually the – um, the trademark of that year was Eric Lindros. That was when he got mm -hmm. drafted to Sault Ste. Marie and didn't report. That was the same year I got drafted by Belleville. And I uh, went to Belleville after Waterloo, was there for three years, really enjoyed my time there. And uh, after that, went to a quick stint in Buffalo and mm -hmm. went to Sabres camp and, and uh, got a call from our coach, Larry Mavity. And he said, uh, well, you can go to Detroit or Sudbury. Where do you want to go? Because we're not doing much this year. So went to Sudbury for that year. And, uh, you know, long story short, I got hurt around Christmas time and uh, ended up cashing in my schoolboy package and went to Dalhousie University for four years after that and continued to play. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, when I was, I needed an internship oddly enough. And uh, when I was looking for an internship that day, I got a call from my mother and she told me that Mike Zaruna, who was a friend from back home, he was in Birmingham, Alabama, and he was looking for a goaltender. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I need an internship. So if you find me an internship, I'll come play for you. And that 32 hour drive from Halifax to Birmingham, and I've been here ever since. Gotcha. Yeah. So like, I was curious, like, like I mentioned before, like Alabama, it's a long, long way from Ontario. Whenever you, you got, uh, you know, to Birmingham, did you kind of, you know, become like a part of that community? And it, did you determine like that was kind of the place that you wanted to spend like the next chapter of your life, even beyond like your time playing? Oh, absolutely. You know, Birmingham is a great place. And, uh, you know, this is where I met my wife and, you know, before I met her, I was actually out in, uh, I think it was back in like 98. I went out to uh, California and did uh, Pro Beach Hockey on ESPN2. And that was a lot of fun. And after that, I was just sitting there one day on the beach and I just looked at the guys I was with and I said, I'm going back to Birmingham, Alabama. And they kind of looked at me and said, like, are you crazy? And mm -hmm. I said, nope, something there for me, guys. So I'm out and loaded up the Firebird and drove back from California to Birmingham and started working here. Still played for the Bulls a little bit mm -hmm. in the East Coast League and, uh, you know, did some color commentary and some radio stuff with them and just really just stayed a part of that family all the way and uh, met my wife in 2000 and this is it. So here we are. Yeah, like whenever you, uh, you know, when you came down, uh, you know, to Alabama, were you 
like surprised at all by like the uh the hockey following in the area was it what you expected was it different and like how have you seen kind of like the hockey uh you know attention kind of growing because obviously you know uh, in Alabama hockey is definitely not one of the first things you think of but have you been like surprised at all by the growth at all well, I, I really was surprised, to be honest with you. I didn't even know that there was hockey in Alabama until yeah. I got that phone call. And I was like, where? Like, Alabama? I have no idea where that even is. So that was back in the day where you couldn't GPS it on your phone. So I actually had to buy a roadmap atlas in order to get here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that was kind of cool. But no, when um, when I came down here, we were playing in the BJCC in Birmingham. And uh, Art Clarkson was the owner, and I was amazed at the promotions that he did. And obviously, I didn't know it then, but it was after football had ended. And um, he brought in the Dallas Cowgirl cheerleaders one game, and the next game he had NASCAR. We had fifteen and 17,000 people there for an East Coast League hockey game. And, you know, I, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. God, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, like – I've I've heard like so many people coming from you know from Canada and, and northern communities kind of impressed by you know the hockey you know experience down here they they use don't hear about as much so it's it's just really interesting uh, you know to hear you know the perspective uh, as far as like coaching goes um, you don't really see a whole lot of uh, former goaltenders get into coaching what did you know at some point you want to get into coaching or like did kind of like the it was just right situation at the right time with an opportunity well it was just one of those things where. Um, with uh, two my two boys growing up and they played hockey, you know, locally in Birmingham and Huntsville and, uh, you know, went off to junior. And I was like, for a long time after I retired, I just kind of stayed out of it and just wanted to be a parent in the stands. And uh, that never lasted very long. And I usually ended up helping out coach the D or do something with the team, come out for practice. And then um, did that on through their minor hockey years and, you know, got my USA hockey levels, different things like that. And then in 2017, the Bulls came back to Pelham and they came in under the SPHL. Right. And uh, the head coach was Jamie Hicks. And, you know, he and I, he was the captain when I played for years. And uh, he was a big Birmingham family guy, too. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to be involved and. In, you know, I said, absolutely, didn't know how much. And because um, I had a real job full time. And uh, but I ended up helping out with their goalies and coming out and um, doing stuff with them and monitoring all their stuff during the games, doing stats and stuff. So that's how I got back in um, and then did that for, you know, four years and then was just kind of approached out of the blue by a former player who I coached in Huntsville. And he was going to the University of Alabama and he had kind of called me and said, hey, you know, like we need a coach. It was after COVID and everything was kind of in disarray. And uh, I said, well, I said, you know, have we got any players. And we had three players, him and two other guys. And uh, I said, well, here's the deal. I said, if, uh, you know, I've heard I've heard some stuff about, you know, coaches and expectations and stuff. You know how I am and I'm old school. So if you're looking for a coach that you want to go out on the road and drink and party with, then, you know, I'm not your guy. But if you want to put a program together and, you know, be a professional deal and you want to try and win some hockey games, I said, absolutely. So that's how it all started. And uh, so we went from three to our first training camp. And lo and behold, it's the University of Alabama. And there was 120 kids there to choose from. So that's where we started three years ago. Yeah, no, I was going to, I was going to mention like kind of the growth, like of hockey uh, on campus at Alabama, uh, probably one of the biggest uh, overall programs with, with multiple teams across multiple levels. Uh, obviously this was the first year of having a division one within AAU college hockey. I was curious kind of like uh, how you would assess, like how the season kind of went uh, compared to like the expectations that you guys had. Um, obviously like the competition is a little different. You see a lot of the same opponents as the past, I was curious, like, what was, what was your sort of assessment on how uh, this season went with, went for you guys? Well, I think it went really well. And, you know, you never, you never really know what to expect in kind of a pilot season. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the AAU did a great job. CHS did a great job organizing everything and, uh, and getting it set up. And I think the biggest difference from 
you know, last year or even, you know, prior years and stuff is there were um, a few more of those games that you really didn't have to show up and, you know, you could go out there and win by five or six goals. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing that I saw this year moving into D1 because we intentionally scheduled, um, you know, more higher caliber teams and, you know, Georgia, South Carolina, Tampa, Auburn. And, um, you know, we loaded up our schedule pretty good. And it was different for the guys because they were used to going, you know, 22 and three. And, you know, when, when we're pushing, uh, you know, a lot better schedule and you're having big competition every night, you know, then it starts to uh, kind of fall down to that level of, okay, what are your guys doing outside of hockey and which team are you going to have on any given night? Because guys have school, guys have other commitments and stuff like that. So that was probably our biggest learning curve this year was just um, coming out and being consistent every night, regardless of who you played. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say, like the uh, like one of the biggest takeaways for me, like on this first year of Division One was like being impressed by like the competition level, like everybody was kind of beating everybody. Like you guys are like one of the first teams in multiple years that have gone uh, into the Clearwater Ice Arena and actually beaten Tampa at their rink. And it's been a few years since that's happened. And that's been really uh, impressive for sure. And I was uh, curious about like uh, what sort of like the, the mentality for a program like Alabama, like you mentioned so many uh, kids within your program so many kids like want to be a part of it when you guys have multiple teams across multiple levels like what's kind of the mindset of the staff and the coaches um are you guys like kind of working together as a whole across all the different levels are you trying to like develop players to move up to the next level like I was curious like what it's like with a with a big program like that we've got so many different teams well and that's exactly how how we we wanted to set it up and we're slowly getting there and it was um, you know, the same thing for the D3 team with their first pilot year. And then mm -hmm. um, it was really cool when the girls team came on after Christmas. And so they got a taste of what, you know, CHS and AAU is all about. And I mean, they had a blast and that oddly enough, that girls team while well, women's team coming in really did a lot for the program because it was like, there was guys from, all the different teams and coaches and everybody chipped in to help them out. And, Hey, you need pucks, you need this. They were going on the ice and, and working with them in some of those uh, initial practices and stuff. So it was, uh, you know, really a cool thing to see happen. And honestly, I think that was probably the biggest thing that happened this year that really brought that unity amongst all the teams together. Yeah, and I was just curious, like uh, what's like a week, week like for you guys like with with practices and games and everything like one thing i'm always interested with uh you know all these programs in the south you know the smaller college towns you don't necessarily have you know the rinks in your in your college towns i know you guys play in pelham i know it's like about an hour or so away from tuscaloosa roughly uh what's it kind of like whenever uh you know a week for you guys whenever you know you don't have the rink in your hometown and you got to travel and you got to put so much time and effort into just like being able to make it happen in the first place well, now that, that was a conversation that um, we had at the start of the year with the the president and the officers and stuff. And it's like, hey, you know, like we're going into D1, um, you know, how are we going to compete? And you saw in previous years going to nationals, you know, the, the biggest thing is keeping your legs under you because, yep. you know, what, what other tournament do you go into that you're playing five games in five days type stuff if you can go all the way? So, you have to have a deep roster and um, you have to have that conditioning going. And with the travel being a factor is one of those things that we decided this year to go, you know, we, we skate one time a week on Wednesday nights and it's, we went for an hour and a half instead of an hour. And so that was good, but that's one of those things as you look around and especially this year from where teams were in September versus where they are now, and, you know, where we are, that that's one thing we'll want to do more of next year is schedule two practices a week, even though it is, you know, an hour drive. But, you know, that that's what it's going to take. And, you know, off ice conditioning and guys getting together and going to the gym. So we're slowly learning um, one by watching, this, you know, seeing what other teams are doing and two, just, you know, reevaluating ourselves and the program and just trying to, you know, shoot better, get better every year. 
and it was always so interesting to hear like the stories and like what all goes into it with uh you know all the travel and stuff that has to happen here in the in the south and everything it's crazy some of the stories of the the programs have to go through uh, i wanted to ask you about uh, a player of yours as well who was also uh earned some college hockey south uh honors this this week uh the D- division one mvp uh max savaloya uh the mvp of division one in this first season uh 31 points in 22 games what was it like uh for ha- for you to have a play like that kind of pace in the way uh for you guys and the conference as a whole too well i mean that that was the thing going all the way back to that first training camp you know mm-hmm. where you know we didn't even we didn't have a returning team so to speak just a couple of uh you know, older, older guys. And, um, Max was one of those guys that I identified, um, like right out of camp. And I was like, Holy cow, this, this kid for just showing up. I mean, he could play hockey. And that was, that was the cool thing about how we've grown as a team because we had so many guys in that first year. And Max was one of them, you know, Sebastian, I know Dumond, you know, all that crew, they all came in together and uh, like I said, these aren't guys that I handpicked or anything like that. These were just kids who came to Alabama and they just want to play hockey. So looking ahead, uh, we got uh, Nationals coming up in a few weeks. Uh, before I talk about uh, this next year's uh, trip to Philadelphia, I have to ask you about last year. Uh, I know that you guys had a really crazy circumstance uh, up there with your group at Nationals um, where you had the funny c- circumstance with uh, – with South Carolina, Liberty, and Fordham. Uh, I think there was uh, one or two ties within the group during pool play and ended up having a forfeit uh, on the last day. You guys ended up having to wait on a uh, on a goal total thing that involved uh, South Carolina and Liberty. I think Liberty had to score like two goals or something. I remember it was crazy. Like you got your guys were all rooting for, for Liberty in the game. It was just a wild circumstance. What was it kind of like going through that? And it was just a strange circumstance all around. Well, it was, it was it was just bizarre to be honest with you because who who ever heard of a tournament or like looking at the way it's set up kind of reminds me a lot of the Olympics with the pool play and right. you know getting out of your pool and going on from there and to have you know the first two games of the pool play and both teams tied mm-hmm. you know I mean that that's just unheard of and um, we're like okay well we'll see what happens next game in the next game you know. Uh, us and South Carolina, we both won, and it's the same thing. We're like, oh, okay, so now what? And then uh, Fordham had some some issues or whatever happened with them, and we showed up at the rink. We're like, hey, there's no game, and it's like, well, okay, so you know. Then that you know all the the AAU brass, they all got together and figured out, okay, well, what are we gonna do here? And uh, I mean, everything was thrown out from potentially us playing South Carolina again the next morning, like eight Mm o'clock before the other, you know, pool started. And um, we just ended up going back with the numbers and uh, their coach, Sirwa, he, he said, yeah, we'll we'll just play it out and see how it goes. And I said, okay, so it is what it is. And, and, you know, I just said that it's unfortunate no matter what the outcome of this is and who goes on, because the bottom line is there's going to be seniors from somebody's team going home and leaving nationals and they never lost a game. So, I mean, it was crazy, but you know, Liberty came in and uh, oddly enough, some of our guys knew some of the guys from Liberty. So they were talking to them the day of, and they're playing South Carolina and they were like, well, Hey, why don't you guys come out and, you know, support us. And, we were like, okay, so we just pass it out to some of the guys. Well, lo and behold, the whole team showed up to get on the bus. Yeah, it was hilarious. Every, everybody came down, and I mean, it was it was unbelievable. For the the guys, were all lined up around the black back glass, and mm-hmm. I mean, what a what an atmosphere for for Liberty for support for them. And then they came down and they scored those two goals right in front of the team, and I was sitting up in the crowd and. The, they were just all going bananas down there, jumping around and losing their minds. And that was, uh, that was kind of the apex of that tournament. And, um, you know, looking back on, on it, some of the takeaways from that is you talk about what it takes to win it all. And you've got to find that level of, you know, just kind of consistency and not having, 
you know, too high of highs or too low of lows and just kind of riding through it. And, you know, it's a grind. And um, that was one of the things that in not playing Fordham and the guys had that day off where it's like, oh, that's great. Well, you get a lot of rest. It was like, well, that wasn't really what our team, you know, we want to play every day and, you yeah. know, keep it rolling. And so being off against Fordham, I think that hurt us a little bit. And then, like I said, I think the guys just expended so much energy going bananas when Liberty scored. And it was almost mm -hmm. like, you know, that was like winning the cup right there. So live and learn and uh, we'll see how it goes when we head back this year. Yeah, I was, I remember uh, being there and it's kind of sitting around like that Sunday morning. It was the the night after the the time change. I remember your game was like supposed to be at nine 30 and we're, everyone was just sitting around kind of wondering like what was going on and everything. And uh, it was just a, a crazy circumstance. And, and you guys obviously ended up advancing. And I, I want to say that you guys uh, were the only team in College Hockey South that's advanced out of pool play the last uh, last two years. I, I believe that is the case. And so as far as like looking ahead to ahead to this year, um, do you think you'll be able to draw on like your team sort of experience because they're kind of familiar with what it takes like in pool play, like you mentioned, having to play three days in a row just to get out of the group alone. Like is your team going to be able to build on that sort of past experience, kind of carry that over this year, even though the format is a little different now with division one being a smaller group this year. Well, and you know, I think with division one having 16 teams, one, I think your competition is going to be, you know, a lot tighter and, I mean, just looking around at the great recruiting job that, you know, all the coaches are doing in the CHS anyway, and some of these players they're bringing in, and I'm like, okay, well, we're going to have our work cut out for us, you know, this year. And um, that will be one of the things to see coming into the tournament, um, you know, with your pool play. You know, I always like being the, you know, the lower seed or, you know, second mm -hmm. lowest or whatever. And – um because it kind of paves your way where, Hey, you know, you're coming down and the bottom line is you just got to win games. And, um, you know, depending on where we finished out, you know, in my hockey rankings, we were kind of sitting around 13 and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Auburn was behind us at 14. So we'll see how these final pools come out, but, um, you know, if we can land at 13 or 14 again, that's actually not a bad pool to be in. Um, because you would have like four, five, nine, and 13. And, uh, you know, anytime you can avoid, you know, one, two, and three in the, in your first round of pool play, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's really where you'd like to fall because those are the teams that when they first come out in their first games, you know, they're all flying and, you know, going a thousand miles an hour. But when you get down into the third day and the fourth day, you know, it's not even so much about who's uh, who can do this or who can do that. It's more about just who who has the the wherewithal and the drive to just go out there and do it and win the war. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Like from from watching like the last two years, it's like you know the the top teams aren't always making it out. The teams with the most talent are always making it out. It's who who's got the depth and who can keep the legs freshest. Uh, you know, to get through get to the finish line. It's a it's a crazy grind. Uh, one last question that I had for you. Um, is about uh, what can hockey become like at the University of Alabama? You see like these programs within the SEC, um, like I mentioned, not having rinks in their hometown, but the programs are still growing. Like you see uh, University of Georgia is getting their own rink built, uh, you know, there in Athens. Uh, where do you think like things can become like with SEC hockey? Do you think there's a, a world within the next 10, 15 years, you know, maybe where these programs uh, with these huge followings could become potentially varsity level NCAA programs. Do you see a world where that's a possibility here in the not too distant future? You know, that's a, that's a great question. You know, UAH, they had the NCAA D1 yep. team and um, way back in the day when uh, Alabama was just first starting out, uh, I was working with their goalies and we went down and actually played UAH. And I think they sat their top two lines and, you know, played their third or fourth string goalie or whatever. And like, we got outshot 77 to to 10 and we lost 11 to one, but great experience. But it just goes to show you like that is a, you know, next tier caliber of hockey player as evidenced by like Cam Talbot going to Edmonton. Right. He was their mm -hmm. like last goal. You came through and kids unreal. Um, but 
you know what? I think it all starts, you know, can everybody get there in the SEC? It, it's going to have to be done the way that George is doing it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, for me, there's, a, you know, a build a rink foundation that's going now. And, you know, they're starting to get some interest with uh, uh, the women's team coming in. So maybe they can, uh, you know, revisit that. But in order for for any school in the SEC to be competitive, they've got to have a rank close enough that you yep. can practice multiple times a week. And uh, that's really where your development comes from is just really the availability of ice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's the biggest thing. I, I've started thinking about it as a possibility recently with, with Georgia getting that, getting that rank. And I was, you know, just curious if, uh, you know, if that point could come for these other small, these other uh, programs, because the programs, uh, you know, the athletic departments at these schools like Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee, these have, they have these massive followings and stuff. And I, I, I think that, you know, at some point, like, I, I think, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight, you know, in the next 10, 15 years or something like that. I, I do think that there, there truly is like some potential for that to happen down the road. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that a hundred percent, especially when you look at, you know, the size of the, the student bodies on the, right. these SEC schools and that's the biggest you thing, you know, all the, all the frats and all the support that even the guys on the team they have, but you know, for them to drive on a, on a Friday or a Saturday night, you know, 55 minutes and, you know, you know, what's going on in the frat world on a Friday or Saturday night. So that, that becomes an issue. Whereas if you had a rink right on or just off campus or things like that, I mean, with 44,000 students at Alabama, I mean, I think that, you know, you could easily put 5,000 people in there every night. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's going to be uh, fun to watch and see where uh, things go from here. So it's been a lot of fun watching uh, your program grow over the years. And so I just want to say uh, thank you again for joining us here on the uh, this latest episode. Congrats on the uh, Coach of the Year honors. And I wish you guys the, uh, the best of luck here at Nationals in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Thanks, Henry. Appreciate it. We'll see you down there. Absolutely. Thanks again. All right. Now, welcome back to the College Hockey South podcast. It is my pleasure now to be joined by the Women's Coach of the Year, from the University of Tampa, head coach Lee Zerfus. Coach, thanks for so much for joining us. Oh, Henry, thank you so much for having me. Of course. Well, uh, congrats on the Coach of the Year honors, and uh, to you and the uh, the UT girls on the uh, the championship this past weekend in the first ever uh, championship of the women's division within College Hockey South. But before we kind of dive into the tournament and the season that was, and looking ahead uh, to nationals down the road. Uh, we wanted to kind of get uh, a little bit of background on you and how your hockey journey kind of brought you to become the uh, the head coach of the uh, Tampa women's hockey team. Sure. Well, it's uh, kind of a mixed bag of uh, treats. So we uh, started with, you know, just like probably most uh, most coaches, uh, the kids start playing hockey and you get on the ice. I had played since I was a small kid and played a couple of years of college hockey. And, um, and then after having kids, you know, it's, uh, one thing just kind of led to another and uh, my oldest being a daughter, uh, she started playing and, you know, we've been uh, out, I'll say, fighting for uh, women's hockey for uh, close to 10 years now. Gotcha. And so talking about the uh, the conference tournament this past weekend, uh, what was it kind of like for you guys uh, going into your first ever uh, tournament within uh, College Hockey South, the women's division? How did how do you think things kind of played out in the uh, the tournament specifically for you guys that ended up uh, with you guys coming out on top? Well, you know, we, we didn't take anything for granted. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, we were facing Miami, and, and Miami is one of those teams that, you know, they have really strong goaltending. Uh, Megan can, can you know, thread a needle with a shot. And, uh, you know, and, and the one thing I think we had going for us is we had the depth of bench. Um, you know, they just weren't able to run um, – you know, three periods with us, but, um, you know, historically it's, it's always been a good game and it's always been an interesting game because, uh, you know, they, they have such problems around the net of, of finding it. And then, uh, South Carolina, that was a, a different one because they started, uh, in the season a little bit late and, uh, but it was very alarming because for us, because they were, they were going undefeated as well. Um, uh, you know, and as I'm looking, I'm racking up points real quick. Um, uh, you know, I realized that it just wasn't one or two people. It was actually a couple lines that uh, we, you know, we needed to be cognitive of and uh, started drafting plans around that. So we've been watching them for a while. And, uh, but you couldn't ask for better hockey, you know, for sure. Uh, you know, that the, you know, Miami game, that was a tight game going into uh, the second period. And then uh, with South Carolina, 
boy, it was a handful. You know, we got up by uh, three and, uh, and boy, we, we, we let off the gas pedal a little bit. And, and next thing you know, it's three, three and, uh, you know, and, and we had to start uh, clamping down again. And, and, you know, we, we found the net with a minute and a half left in the game and, uh, you know, wound up squeaking a victory out. So it was, uh, you know, a great day for Tampa. The boys had uh, finished up the day before uh, with their championship. And, you know, for us to do the same thing, uh, you know, what, what a great day for, uh, for Tampa hockey. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that championship game specifically uh, against South Carolina. Obviously, you guys have gone through the, the regular season undefeated. A lot of lopsided scores. You guys are winning big regularly. And obviously that was the first matchup with South Carolina and ended up being like the first close game for you guys that season. How did you think your team sort of responded to, uh, you know, a tighter game like that uh, that you guys hadn't really seen before that se this season so far? Yeah, we, you know, we, we were pretty tense. Um, you know, it, the biggest thing was just trying to get everybody settled. And, uh, you know, the girls hadn't faced, you know, again, you know, it was it was a good weekend for us. Miami certainly set the, the tempo for us. Um, you know, I, I think we were just as nervous uh, Saturday as we were Sunday, um, you know, starting out the game. But again, you know, we uh, we knew what we needed to execute to to have a chance of winning. Uh, but to your point, you know, I mean, Henry, we we didn't know what we were going to get ourselves into. Uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of game film on it. So, uh, you know, we, we just had to, to come out strong and and. You know, we knew if we could do that, that again, you know, historically we've, we've seemed to have fared pretty well when, it, you know, uh, by the end of the third period, you know, we, we, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a different game altogether. Um, and the girls really had to um, really adjust for the stress, um, you know, and, and it, everything worked out in the end, but it got really dicey for a while and, and it was great. I mean, the girls responded really well to it. Um, initially it was a, a tough pill to swallow, I think, um, you know, but they, they, they settled down um, and then, you know, they got back to playing hockey, their style of hockey. And, and ultimately I think that's what helped us prevail. Absolutely. It's been a, a lot of fun following you guys. It's been really impressive. The, re the results you guys have been posting all season. Uh, I was curious, like, obviously this is the first official season of the women's division with, within college hockey South. I'm curious sort of like what your expectations were coming into this season uh, for your team and sort of how your uh, how the girls end up living up to it. I imagine probably exceeded expectations. Obviously, undefeated season is really impressive. I was just curious what you were expecting coming in and how things kind of lived up to it. Uh, again, great question, Henry. I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been around the UT team. Uh, you know, my my daughter had a chance to see them a couple of years ago when uh, Rindhouse was the coach. And, uh, you know, and it, it's an outstanding family. It's a great coach, great. Uh, you know, he, he's got a couple of kids that played in uh, – you know, and, and so, you know, I've been familiar with the program and then uh, I got a call from uh, Casey that was looking, you know, they were looking for a coach and, um, you know, the experience that I had with the Florida Alliance uh, girls program with the tier one, tier two programs, uh, my daughter playing and coaching the lightning. Uh, I started out with them probably six, seven years ago. So, you know, going into the season as it being a club team, I, we really didn't know what to expect. It was, you know, brand new. I, um, you know, but if you had asked me, you know, in July, uh, you know, about the hockey and, and where we would be as, as far as a conference, you know, I never would have thought we would have had uh, girls college hockey in the South. Um, and, and then to see the compete level, the way that the season ended, uh, it, it's really exciting stuff. I mean, you know, the reality is, is that I think it's like 23 out of 24 girls stopped playing hockey at the age of 18. Uh, there's nowhere to go, you know, and, and, working with the Alliance 19 tier two program, uh, when you don't make that cut for tier one, it's, it's pretty devastating. You know, you, you've played most of your life. It's been, you know, uh, a high level of competition. The compete level is there, you know, and, and then you're sitting there and, and all of a sudden it's, it's kind of the reality of that it's coming to an end, uh, you know, hits you pretty hard in, in for Beantown, you know, which is, you know, typically for youth hockey, that's, that's where, the season starts for a lot of the tier one, tier two programs. So, um, you know, to, to go into the season, not knowing what we had, but excited there was something, you know, last year, I think we had nine girls in the program. Uh, this year we had 23. So uh, we had a goalie drop out at the last minute. So, you know, three weeks into the season, you know, we didn't even know what was going to happen. Uh, you know, and, and Casey was able to find a, a a girl on the program that had played goalie uh, years ago, meaning, you know, when she was younger, 
Um, and thank heavens for that. You know, it, it's it's what got us our start. Uh, but at the end of the day, we we were really fortunate because uh, I would say the majority of our program, you know, we have girls from Minnesota, from Boston, from, you know, from Connecticut, uh, Chicago, Detroit, uh, you know, for, from a coaching standpoint, uh, it was a really unique situation for me um, because it had to do with tempering the girls. You know, we we had a lot of alphas and uh, a lot of girls that could find the net. All the girls had played hockey before. So, you know, we were in a really unique position, a, a fortunate position, um, you know, but we started out the season in the Florida Women's Hockey League and we went 0 for 4 um, because we couldn't string together passes. We couldn't, you know, we we had, you know, a half dozen girls that were trying to carry the team by themselves. Uh, and when you're playing against, you know, uh, I'll call it alumni that we're playing D1, D3, you know, we didn't stand a chance. Um, you know, and, and then as we started, you know, that that's really the first thing as far as the commitment to the program um, and a commitment to a system that said, hey, we can't be selfish with the puck. Uh, you know, and we're very much an East-West type of team where, you know, puck possession is everything for us. Yeah, absolutely. One uh, One sort of thing I was curious about is, you know, Becoming an official club this year, I know that the girls have been playing together for for a while now at, at UT. Uh, who are some of the people kind of leading the charge uh, for the program? I know Casey Kennedy, president and captain, was a huge part of that. Um, what was it like, uh, you know, becoming an official club this year? What all kind of went into the process? Um, obviously, it helped that the girls have been playing together for a while. So just give us a little insight and in how, like, it all kind of came together this year and it was the right time with College Hockey South. Well, you, you know, again, that's a great question. Um you know, the, the girls were 100% responsible for getting us where we were at to get the season started. You know, they, uh, you know, CHS had reached out, uh, you know, we were, you know, trying to find games, exhibition games, things like that. We were playing some programs in the, out of the ACHA and then lo and behold, uh, you know, CHS comes around and, and, you know, obviously with the, the men's side of it, uh, you know, there's, I think what, 56, 56 teams in the program, um, uh, you know, and, and then to find out that USF, you know, was able to put together a team, uh, Miami, again, able to field the team, uh, Auburn, Georgia, uh, you know, it started looking really, really interesting, uh, you know, but it was a lot of hard work, you know, uh, the whole board for, because it is a club team, everyone shares responsibility. Um, so it wasn't a single lift by anybody, uh, rather it was a team effort. And, and these girls have been working on it well before I got involved with it. And, and uh, you know, at the beginning of the season, I was kind of a line item. You know, I was just, uh, you know, the last component to, you know, a year-long effort to to realize that we could be in a, a league, uh, a competitive one at that. And, uh, and, and how exciting. I mean, you know, thank God for that because, you know, you can't take anything for granted. And, and we know that it's a fragile situation right now. I've, I've had my fair share of uh, – you know, startups, if you will, with teams, with the, the girls trying to get them off the ground. Um, you know, and, and back then, I mean, when the Alliance started six years ago, I think we had 25 girls that tried out for two teams. You know, and now we've got 170 girls in the program. So, you know, and that's over, what, six years. Um, so you see the rate that it's growing. And it's really interesting because a lot of the girls that are down here right now are trying to get up north to play. And, and I find what's really interesting is all the girls from – you know, uh, in the colder states, if you will, are very interested in coming to Florida for some sunshine. And, and you know, and obviously the, the education from UT is is first and foremost. That's, you know, that's the one rule that we have is, is education's first. There is no excuse for that. Um, you know, so we believe in development as much off the ice as we do on the ice and, and school comes first. So if you got a cramp for an exam and it means missing practice, then, you know, that's what we do. And if I got half a team that can't make it, then we scrub the practice and, you know, reschedule. But, uh, you know, for the girls to pull this off and, and do what they did, uh, hats off to them. I mean, what a great learning experience and and what a way to get yourself started and, and you know, some life skills. And, and that's what we've, you know, I, I joked with the girls, I could probably help them more with, you know, off the ice stuff than I could on the ice. Uh, and it's really come full circle for us. You know, we're, we're, we're close, we're, we're together. Uh, we have our ups and downs, but at the end of the day, uh, it's the culture and the character of the team. Um, we wouldn't be able to do what we've done without that. Yeah, you mentioned like how so much of the uh, the team is representative of, of girls coming from up north. That's really representative of UT as well. Uh, 
having all these girls who've played hockey before and have been playing together, what was that kind of like as a coach with these girls having the experience of that they do, especially compared to a lot of the other women's division, other programs had girls who were playing for the first time, which is awesome. But what was it like for you having such an experienced group of, of girls who, who had played together and had, you know, such long experiences in hockey previously? Henry, it's the toughest coaching job I've ever had. Um, you know, it, 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 what a unique set of problems, you know, we, we, uh, you know, all, all the teams are stewards, you know, it's like with the, the coach of the year award, I had a lot of the teams saying congratulations and, um, you know, and, and I had to stop them. I mean, I'm, I'm humbled and, and the humility that goes along with that is, is, you know, I'm still trying to absorb it because um, it's a first year program, you know, um, but it wasn't me. It was, it's always been the girls and it's always been about the girls. You know, these are young women that, you know, still wanted to play hockey um, and to have an education first and, and then to be able to, to suit up. Uh, they're grateful to play, you know, and, and so in answering your question or expanding on it, uh, it, it was really difficult because. You know, how do you how do you let the girls play that are used to playing um, and at the same time keep things competitive, if you will, to where, you know, we coined the phrase early on in the season. It was it was as, you know, scoring with class, scoring with dignity, where, you know, if you're going to put one in the net, make sure that it's something that you could show somebody how to do it. OK, um, so it wasn't the breakaways. It wasn't, uh, you know, it was two, three passes. It was center lines. It was. Uh, you know, back doors. It was things that, you know, I, I would like to think that we could all learn from. Um, and I, and like I said, it was the hardest coaching job I've ever had because we had we we didn't have the problem everyone else had initially, at least. Um, you know, with with South Carolina again, Miami. Uh, it it shows that you know we we have room for both. Um, you know, but it was really difficult. I, I I you know every every weekend was a challenge because we 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 had respect for our, our competition. And, you know, the last thing you want to see happen is, you know, you have a, a, a young woman that wants to, to pick up the sport, you know, and we were fighting for that for so many years of, of just getting them involved, you know, um, to say that it's okay to, to give it a whirl uh, and to see it in the college level, you know, a lot of the programs, you know, they, uh, there are girls, are, a lot of the goalies had never played before. Um, you know, and, and to turn around and 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 I and and I think we the, the biggest thing was being respectful. And again, that goes down to character and the culture is that uh we understand where it's at. Uh we want to be a, a part of the solution and not part of the problem. We're not interested in trying to run anybody off. I have a very unique problem. Um, you know, and, and I think again, because you know, UT is a, a, a private university that um it caters to you know, the schools that were prop schools from up north and things like that, where, you know, our draw as far as talent goes was was pretty easy. Uh, it's not that often that you, you start off the, the season, uh, certainly with, with not a whole lot of recruiting where you've got 23 and you've got to, you know, you got to come up with three healthy scratches for a game. Um, you know, things that we weren't prepared for. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I said, it was, we've always had uh, an understanding and, and appreciation for, uh, the league in general and all the teams that are competing because we're all in it together and, and the, the we, we can't allow it to fail. It's just that simple. Yeah. So obviously like this past weekend with, with you guys winning the women's conference championship, the men's uh, from the university of Tampa also won the division one. Uh, there were some cool videos of the guys there supporting uh, the team and everything. University of Tampa hockey team has become one of the bigger programs within college hockey South with, with multiple men's teams and now a women's team. Uh, what's it kind of been like working with uh, the men's team and such a big program all around? What's it kind of been like uh, as an overall hockey program working with uh, with the men's teams as well and the sport they've kind of given you guys as well? Sure. Well, you know, I, you know, you know, I, I think it's safe to say they paved the way for us, right? Um, you know, there's a commitment level from the university that um, you know goes to supporting the sport itself. You know, the sport um, in addition to to some financial considerations, meaning. Uh, the university helping us out financially with uh, getting the team going, um, you know, and, and with that comes responsibility, obviously. So uh, to have the men's program set the the, the bar for us, uh, the last thing we wanted to do is, uh, you know, field a team that, uh, you know, wouldn't be indicative of, of what the what the university itself represents, um, you know, and, and to have both programs now that the D1, the D2, uh, and then the women's. Uh, you know, again, it's it's uh, 
Uh, it's great to be a part when they did the bridge. You know, we, you know, four or five years ago, Casey had commented that, uh, you know, there were people within the, the university that thought that, you know, it would be difficult to kind of have the two two teams mesh together um, and to be supportive of each other. And, and you know, to the contrary. Um, and I think everyone was pleasantly surprised by that because, you know, you have all these uh, levels of compete. Uh, the men's program, to your point, is, uh, you know, it's it's really solid hockey. You know, I would put that up against ACHA. Um, and certainly you're, 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 you know, call it your bottom half or your, your top, thir- you know, bottom 30 schools of NCAA D3. Um, they can compete, you know, and, and they come from all over the country to to be a part of this. So uh, to have the girls program join it and, and again, what, uh, College Hockey South and AAU did uh, to to give us a chance. Uh, you know we're grateful, um, but to to have the men's program cheer us on in the semifinal, um, and then you know to watch them win theirs, uh, you know it's it's really the ideal world. You know that that's that I think that says a lot for the type of uh, students that that come into the program uh, that attend the university. You know it's a uh, uh, maybe a higher expectation, if you will, but uh, they have that compete level and, and then they have that support. Um, you know, it, it really kind of tempered uh, some of the things that we struggled with, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned like, you know, the growth of the game within, you know, the university as a whole uh, in the Tampa area, the, the sports becoming so big. Uh, you mentioned uh, the lightning earlier. I know that a lot of the roots in the area for people, you know, kind of come uh, with the lightning following the club. Um, you know, seeing a winning product on the ice for them. What sort of role do you think that the the Lightning organization has kind of had in, in growing the game here in the uh, the Tampa Bay area, and especially with the women's game in particular? So, what what kind of role do you think that they've kind of played as far as growing the game here in our uh, in our community specifically? All right. Well, it, it's been huge. Um, you know, it, it started with Kristen Bonus. Uh, you know, her, her father was a coach with the Lightning, and and she's over in Nashville now, and I. Uh, you know, during the championships, I actually had a chance to meet with her at the national game. And, and, you know, we were reflecting on what it was like seven, eight years ago uh, when we started out the the, the learn to play programs. And, uh, you know, we were no different than some of the college programs back then where, you know, to, to try and field the team, first of all, was was an undertaking. Um, and thank God we, we had the support of the Lightning and the Lightning made program, uh, their community outreach and and you know, the the, uh, the Lightning had put a, a program together that they wanted to get 10,000 sticks in the hands of young kids uh, so that they could learn to to appreciate the game and want to play. Uh, you know, and then the Learn to Play programs, it, it's a very cost-effective program that, go you know, runs like eight weeks and includes all your gear. Uh, and, you know, it's a great way to, to get your feet wet. So uh, they were 100% instrumental. And, and, you know, they certainly catered to you know, I'll call the, you know, the non-tier two and, and and tier one programs where, you know, the reality is, is that the bulk of the girls sit within the community outreach side of it. Um, you know, and that's why this league is so important because uh, it gives girls an option. You know, you can go for school first, uh, you know, and, and then learn to play the sport or, or continue playing. So uh, the Lightning by far were uh, the catalyst of all this. I would argue, uh, you know, because we had, you know, I, I mean, we had a 10U, a 12U, a 16U program uh, that we started with uh, in all levels of, you know, participation. Uh, you know, but it certainly didn't cater to, like, the Lady Vipers, which was uh, the Tier 1 program at the time. Uh, we had Saddlebrook that started a program out of uh, Center Ice, and then the Alliance uh, came in a couple years later. Uh, you know, and that was a real nice alignment. So as that we were trying to figure out hockey in Florida, you know, we had that pyramid of... Uh, you know, of, of starting out and, and, you know, as your skills increase, you, you started getting towards, you know, more of an elite program like the light, uh, like the Alliance represents. So, uh, you know, to be able to feed that now into the university programs in the South is huge. You know, a lot of these girls didn't have a place to go um, and now they do. Um, you know, I think we've got uh, four girls from the Alliance 19 tier two program that want to come play hockey for uh, UT and stay in the state you know, the Florida prepaid, uh, the education part of it, um, you know, and, and so again, it, it's just amazing how all this stuff has come together. Yeah, you mentioned like uh, girls wanting to spend, you know, the next chapter of their lives at the University of Tampa, continuing their hockey career. 
uh, another like big, quick, big picture sort of question is like, where do you think uh, things can go like for the University of Tampa women's team? Obviously, just in the first year, do you think there's a chance of it becoming more of like a, a somewhat of a destination for players to want to come to? Which I know that's what it seems like for the men's team. You know, so many players coming from out of state. Where do you think like things can go for the uh, the women's program here in the you know beyond just this first season? Well, you know, I mean, the AAU and CHS has done a really good job promoting the uh, conference and and the spotlight that they put on the championships was uh, was significant. You know, uh, just this week alone, you know, the recruiting part, uh, you know, for me, I think got a little bit easier because, uh, you know, a lot of people found out about our program this weekend. Um, you know, and if you watch the game, uh, you know what, this caters to a bunch of people that are looking to play and continue playing. Um, that's that that was first uh you know I had a, I finally had a chance on Tuesday night to review the, the the game film and uh you know and and the commentators that we had were spot on with it as far as you know the girls being involved with it and, and the coaching the decisions that we were making and um uh, it was a collective lift you know so uh from a recruiting standpoint there's no doubt it helped us it it you know shine the spotlight that it is a destination um uh, you know, and that we're serious about it. You know, we, we gained Alabama and Georgia Southern for next year. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I never thought in a million years I'd be playing somebody like Auburn, for instance, and, you know, to see the Auburn colors out on the ice or Alabama or or Georgia colors out on the ice, you get goosebumps, man. You know, I, I uh, it's it's pretty cool, you know, and, and you know, to, to think that it's hockey related and, and you're playing these powerhouses of universities, uh, if it doesn't get you excited, I, you know, I don't know what would from a college, uh, you know, academic and, and athletic standpoint, you know, this is incredible what's, what's going on, you know, I, uh, it's really cool. So, you know, a chance to, to hit a title, you know, and then, you know, in three weeks from now, we got a chance to, to you know, carry on our, our undefeated season uh, for the national championships. You know, these are things even in D1, D3 program that, you know, unless you're in the top four, you'll never get to experience some of this stuff. Um, you know, they have the men's team ruin you on. You know, these things just don't happen in other programs. Um, so again, I think it's a testament to the program, you know, to the to the conference and the way that Kyle has put everything together. Um, you know, it's inclusive um, and it's good hockey. So uh, I'm yeah, I mean, I'm really excited for for what the future represents. It's a uh, you know, I can see already, I mean, the USF team is busting at the seams. Georgia's busting at the seams. Auburn, Alabama, these are all programs that, you know, it wouldn't surprise me in the next two to three years that we don't have two flights, meaning that, you know, we have a D1 and a D2 or a D1, D3 type situation where we can even out the playing field as far as the compete level goes. Uh, and I, I'm really excited. I mean, I think five years from now, uh, a lot of people are going to be looking back at this and saying, Boy, right time, right place, and and right formula. Yeah, no, it's been certainly a lot of fun to watch uh, the growth of the program uh, this year and the women's division as a whole. It's been you know, it's certainly an exciting time. Uh, you mentioned nationals. Uh, last question I have for you is going to be about uh, nationals in a couple of weeks. Uh, what's going to sort of be the message uh, for your team going into this? I know that the uh, the bar is going to be set high for you guys undefeated. Uh, you're going to be facing some teams that you haven't seen so far this season. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be seeing some conference opponents as well. What's going to be kind of the message uh, to your group uh, heading into nationals, obviously uh, undefeated season. Uh, what's going to be sort of the, the preaching point from a coaching standpoint? You know, again, culture and character, um, stay humble. You know, we've gotten this far because what our, the system that we work by, uh, everyone's bought into it. Um, you know, and, and I think if we fracture that, then we're in serious trouble. Um, if we stay true to, to our laurels and, and, you know, what we represent as a program, um, then I think we're going to be able to bring something that, you know, a team that can compete. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's worrisome. Um, uh, you know, I don't take it for granted. I didn't take last weekend for granted. Um, you know, because, you know, you got a huge bullseye on your, on your back and, and, you know, there's not a team right now, uh, you know, in either conference that wouldn't be interested in taking a swipe at us and, and knocking us off the bar stool, if you will. So, um, yeah, I, I'm very concerned about it and, and, you know, we're going back to our practices. We'll be able to get in, I think, three three practices before we get up there. Um, I'm looking at getting ice uh, the night before we play uh, so that the girls are, are ready and, and, you know, we can bring the best game possible to, to try and represent, again, our conference and the university. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a lot of fun uh, watching you guys take things uh, onto the national stage. 
Well, Coach, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining us. Congrats again on the uh, the conference championship and the Coach of the Year honors. I, uh, I'm looking forward to watching you guys uh, continue the journey this year and beyond. So, thanks again for joining us this week on the on this latest episode. Yeah, George, and, you know, Henry, thank you so much too. It, it um, you know, it, we're all in it together. So to to spend the time this morning and and uh, to do the things that you're doing. You know, it doesn't go unnoticed, that's for sure. And, and we appreciate everything you're doing. So, you know, on, ha on behalf of the program and the university, we appreciate you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a lot of fun talking about, uh, you know, so many of the great programs that we have here in uh, here in the Tampa area and, of course, across College Hockey South. So it's a lot of fun. So, Head Coach uh, Lee Zervis, thanks again for joining us uh, this week on this latest episode. All right. Cheers. Thanks again. Yep. All right, and we hope that you enjoyed both of those interviews. We want to say thank you as well to Greg Dreveny and Lee Zerfus for joining us on this week's episode. It was a lot of fun chatting with them. We want to send a thank you as well along to our producer, Harrison Smadjevich, for producing uh, this episode and all of our episodes here at the College Hockey South podcast. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe right here on the College Hockey South YouTube channel. And while we're at it, I'll just mention the men's Division II playoffs uh, going on this weekend in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, beginning today, Friday, going all the way through the championship game on Sunday. So if you're not able to make it to the rink in Huntsville uh, to see the action there in person, make sure to check it out right here on the College Hockey South YouTube channel. And so thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll talk to you again next week. Make sure you keep it here on the College Hockey South YouTube channel for the Division II playoffs coming up this weekend. Thanks again.